Hey, guys. <laughs> What's happening? <laughs> Do you remember the Budweiser uh, commercial? The what's up? What's up? I used to love it. <laughs> I never had a Budweiser in my life, but I used to say that like every single day. <laughs> now you say gangster every day. Now I say gangster every That's day. That's gangster. You should bring yep. it back, Austin. Bring what's up. Back. What's up? It's <laughs> <laughs> not going to work. Nobody likes that. Nobody wants to hear that. I don't know. <laughs> this is Top Line. This episode of Top Line is brought to you by Contract Book. Raise your hand if you love managing contracts. We didn't think so. Contract Book offers a holistic contract management platform equipped to handle agreements of all shapes and sizes. Through automation and centralized management, they unlock the value of your data while creating lovable contracting moments for teams and organizations. Visit contractbook.com to take control of your contracts for good. Asa, do you want to introduce everybody? You've never done it yet. Holy shit. No, you guys go for it. You guys are great. <laughs> no, at no, 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 Asa, I think, yeah, since this is what you guys talked about in your text, actually, this is, what it is. <laughs> this is exactly, no, Asa, you got the, I want to hear this intro. You yeah, got come on, go. Oh, yeah? Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 15, not 14, of Top Line. I, uh -huh. I'm joined here with Sam Jacobs, CEO and founder of Pavilion, and AJ Bruno the second CEO and co-founder, the third, the three of them, <laughs> the CEO and co-founder of Quarterpath, and myself, Asad Zaman, CEO, not founder of Sales Talent Agency. Hi, guys. Former door-to-door former -door salesman, former oh, martial no. artist, and mixed martial arts master. There we go. Yeah. Yeah, I like your yeah. add-ons. So awesome did that. But Sam, I assume that everyone in sales has interviewed like when they first started their career for a door-to-door -door sales job. Like I did. It was like, how do you not get a door-to-door -door sales job? It's a hundred percent commission. Our company will be like, just come. <laughs> like, well, was... the interview process in 2007 was you showed up with like 13 people and everyone, they're, they're like, you show up at seven in the morning. And they're already. What, the, what the, company was this? What were you selling? It was. It was. It was I was selling. Uh, switching to Verizon uh, cable from fifty six k to like. Yeah, I mean, I didn't. I was just. But the interview process was you did a day of work. Like you literally did the work. Uh, so you show up, and then like they're all doing their. <laughs> That's <power> great. <laughs> what, do, what a scam! <laughs> I need to scam. introduce that at SDA. Yeah, so <laughs> one of those companies where like you, you Google the company, and there wasn't really much information about it, and then you Google three months later, and it changed its name again five times. It was like one yeah. of those franchises. So anyway, they could do the powwow and then they come out and they're like, all right, let's get started on your interview. And the interview was I get in uh, this 1996 Toyota Corolla uh, with this this woman and we were driving around Norristown, uh, Phil, outside of Philadelphia and like Norristown, eh, it's, a, <laughs> it's an up and coming uh, <laughs> suburb of Philadelphia to put it mildly. <laughs> and so we're going into all these stores and just like flower shops, a printer shop there. Uh, so I remember going into this one was sweet old, like 85 year old man is sitting there and he's like, the computer is like an Apple II, right? It's from like 1983. So we're sitting there and this, the woman I was with is, is proceeding to try to like get him to convert. And actually, you know, he's like, whatever. So he's like, let me sign my life away basically into this thing. But so she's just like upselling him on these ridiculous things. There's like, Hey, do you want a VPN? I'm like, this guy, <laughs> this guy does not need a VPN. This is not the thing he needs right now. So we're halfway through the day. We got a 15 minute lunch break. And I just, at that point was like, this is not commission only. This is not, gonna, this is not the job for me. So I, I bounced. You made it half a day. I made it half a day and I had like a, I had an existential crisis then. I was like, I can't, I'm like, what am I, what the fuck am I doing with my life? Like, how is this going to, how is this going to matriculate? I, that was my door to door interview process. Sam, you didn't have this. This didn't exist. I sold, I delivered pizzas. I feel like that's not quite door to door sales, but it's, uh, it, uh, that was my professional low point, similar to what you just described, AJ, which was, I was delivering pizzas while I was running, uh, Annex Records, the record label that I started. Ooh, and, um, record labels are hard. There's the worst, yeah. absolute worst business. And so I show up also to an up and coming neighborhood. <laughs> and uh, during, and I could only work during, I worked during lunch, which is not the time to work for a pizza delivery. And uh, it was $7 and 42 cents. And the kid gave me $7 and 50 cents and told me to keep the change. Wow. And, uh, 
that was just, that was a moment in which I'm like, what am I doing with, maybe I shouldn't be doing this record label thing. This isn't working. Yeah. I had a record label too. And I realized it is the hardest, the toughest, the worst business to ever run. Yeah. That's the like a, we share that. industry is not a, not a good thing. It's not. The first time I went to, so the company I did door to door at, I went to interview with them in my uh, first year of university. And I was fresh from Pakistan. I wore a suit. It was like a three piece suit and shit and made my tie. Gold um, watch. And I, yeah, I have a fake gold watch, everything. I <laughs> shaved and I go there and it's in this warehouse and we're just sitting in this room and there were three people next to me. They all had like those prison bracelets, like they were just out of prison. And I was like, what am I doing here? Like what's happening? Everybody was in like uh, vests and I was in like the suit. And so I went home, I didn't do it. And then next year I went back there and that's when I actually started working there and I killed it and made real money. But you the first sold, time you sold uh, the things that c create aerate the lawns, right? Like you yeah. punch holes in the lawns so that the Lawn grass aeration. Can come back. Yeah, and awesome. then they would make you do the service as well, so it was like good for the summer. Like you would lose weight. Like you, you would be fit in the summer because of it. And today he sells athletic greens. There we go. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and hiring salespeople. Well, well, why don't you, Asad, you are our docket organizer. What are we talking about first? Let's do a market uh, recap. We haven't touched on the market uh, properly in a bit. So let's start there. Um, I can create a jumping off point. So we touched on this very lightly last time around, but the inflation uh, from a macro perspective is the most important KPI in the world right now, especially in North America, especially for tech in North America. And inflation is down to 3%. July of last year was 8.5%. Uh, the target is 2%, so we're very close to it. Um, so that means that interest rates are now not going to have to go up much longer, uh, which means that the economy, which has been forcefully cooled down, is not going to be forcefully cooled down much further than this, which I think is quite a positive sign. It increases the probability of a soft landing to becoming the most probable outcome. Last month, when we got the 4% uh, rating, we said that this is the beginning of the end, and I think we were right. Um, that was the beginning of the end, and we're most likely going to get the soft landing, which is quite amazing. If you dig into this a bit deeper, the U.S. has the fastest growth and the lowest inflation out of all G7 countries. Um, the OECD countries measure this thing called the Gini coefficient, which is a measurement of income inequality. Um, ours has gone down or the U.S.'s has gone down by 25% in the last year. I, I should just move there, guys. Fuck yeah, it. I know. Uh, I know. Um, the S&P is up. 17%. So the stock market's doing really well. Uh, the All In guys did a really good job at talking about what the rest of the year is going to look like in the stock market. We should go and listen to that. And I would agree with them. But just because of all of these really... What did they say? What did they say? Chamath's point of view was that the market's going to rip right now. That basically inflation's done. Uh, interest rates are not going up. People are going to retail investors, hedge funds, et cetera, are going to go long on these stocks. It's going to push the stocks up. So there, he was quite bullish about where the market is going. And Chamath is the reason why I got out of the market at the peak of the market in November 2021. I heard one of their podcasts and he was talking about this is the peak. And you I got sold, out in November of 21? I sold everything, literally. Wow. I owned You're nothing. Amazed. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah, I got out of the peak. I got out yeah, at the yeah. peak <laughs> uh, and I didn't get back in for like nine, 10 months. And then I got in lightly. And then recently, a few um, uh, weeks ago, I got in properly. Look at you, you dollar know. cost averaging over there. What's up? Yeah. Market timing and he's being brilliant. I mean, uh, that, you, wow, you must feel. Yeah, Austin, I got a question though. Like I, I hear these things on like the, oh, hey, 3%. Now it's close to 2%. But like, Obviously, prices and consumer prices are, are not going down. So like there it's great that there's like stabilization, but does that just become normal? I, I mean, I don't know. I think I had the first realization a few weeks ago when I was at a five guys and I bought a twelve dollar and fifty cent burger. And like that was I was like, is this is this just like this is just life now? This is it. How much was it before? I don't know, eight dollars probably. <laughs> hey, I remember back in my day, I could get a big five dollars. Uh, no, so, I just, I just think it's like it's, it's like the I, I, I have to wonder and have to think that consumers are really, really starting to really think through some of these um, costs, these real costs, and like, what does that do to retail in the fall? Is there like there's there's another side to this, right? Like something's going to happen and got to give. 
consumers have a lot of excess capital that they've been spending down. And that's been one of the counter forces in this economy. Um, obviously, prices have gone up in a lot of different things. And there's some types of inflation that comes back down, like eggs. You know, what happened was that in North America, there was this disease that impacted, I think they had to kill 40 million chickens. And so then there was a reduction in supply of eggs. And so egg prices went up. Well, that'll eventually come down. Gas prices come down. Rent comes down. Wage inflation doesn't come down very easily, right? So there's some things where you will see the effect and some places, prices will stay high. But when you look at the overall economy uh, from a macro perspective, it is important that inflation comes into this 2% range because that impacts the interest rates. And the cost of borrowing, like you, you've seen people who have to, you know, if you're buying a house right now, a more, uh, the interest rates on mortgages is very high. Um, and some people on variable mortgages got really screwed when uh, the inflation became a problem and interest rates had to come up. So you do need this to get into a controllable state. Doesn't mean it's going to affect you. Maybe Five Guys stays at 12 bucks instead of $8, but your eggs will get cheaper, your gas will get cheaper, well, some things will get cheaper. Also, also, all of our companies will become more valuable. You know, our hey. asset values move in inverse direction to the interest rate. So the the other benefit obviously is that like the the multiples on tech companies will probably slightly expand. I don't know that they'll ever be where they were two years ago, but certainly it'll become a much friendlier environment. It'll also be an easier financing environment. If interest rates are low, then it's easier to access debt capital. It's easier for people to make those kinds of investments and, and deploy that capital. It's easier for people to make an equity investment backed by debt in some way or do some kind of, you know, some kind of well, structured just, transaction. Investor sentiment changes at that point, right? Like the, right. the momentum of it changes. And that's kind of what really reverses. I think we've, the three of us have seen that really firsthand. It's like, this is, this is the good news is good news in the sense that it's like people are starting to think about things differently. And that's what I, I mean, I think it's, you know, cause I've been thinking about it obviously for Pavilion and it's like, I just think everything will probably line up so that once again, when things start to dramatically improve for my business, I'm crediting myself and not the economy, even though, again, it'll probably be the economy driving the growth. But I think it's what we've talked about, which is that first, once we know that the Fed, I mean, I tend to agree with Chamath and I, I'm trying to, I, I would like to be back in the market by this fall. And I think next year is going to be probably a 20% year for the for equities. And, um, but the, the whole thing is getting, making it to like March or April, you know, it's like, I think, uh, it's still going to be tough in tech for the rest of this year because of what we right. talked about, which is that companies not doing well, needing to raise money and investors having a lot more hand and a lot more leverage than they had the last time they wrote these checks. And so I think it's still going to be difficult, but you know, the whole thing about, um, like what invest like why do I teach this class at in CRO school and we talk about like why do investors like recurring revenue businesses besides obviously like the cash? It's because you can invest against predictability. And yeah. so if you know that things are gonna get better, you're you much it. Yeah, exactly. You just feel like if it's okay if things are bad now, if you have certainty that things will get better. And if you have certainty that things will get better, you can deploy capital. And if you don't know what's gonna happen, then you can't deploy capital because there's a chance it could get worse. So I think things are I think they will start to feel better in our little corner of the world, but maybe not for a little bit. I think you, know, you hit the nail on the head. Go ahead. Go ahead, Austin. I was just going to say that I think it is important that we we keep highlighting that just because we've got these good signals doesn't mean that the market does a 180. It's still going to take some time for things to improve. I think if you think back to when inflation became an issue, right? It was November, October 2021. It, the private markets were still ripping in Q1 2022, even in Q2 2022. As a business, we had our highest uh, growth, highest revenue, most profitable, most placements quarter in Q2 2022 um, because of how hot the private market was in tech. Um, Sam, I'd done, I think, the podcast with you in uh, February 2021. I remember the data from then. There were 92,000 software salespeople in the top 10 markets of North America against 140. 
146,000 open jobs. Right now, they're not even 146,000 open soft, uh, tech sales jobs in all of North America. And so the market takes a while to react to these things. It is going to be six to nine months. And during those six to nine months, there's going to be more pain than we have seen so far, because we've highlighted that at that growth stage, there's about 500 to 1,000 companies um, that have a liquidity crunch. They can't raise money and they have to cut down or shut down. And that's going to be depressing and morale is going to be low in the ecosystem, but then things will get better. Yeah, we were talking about, uh, for listeners out there, we, we won't say which company, but I don't think we've mentioned our text exchange about the company that raised over $100 million. And, uh, and then I don't even know if it's public, but, you know, um, gave $50 million. But does that, that was the data that you heard, AJ, right? $50 million yeah, that, back to investors. But it's really interesting to think about it because it's obviously if you're a company you want to, and you're a founder, CEO, you're in a really tough spot. You're looking for a soft landing to sell the company. You have 50 million in cash. So like you're, you're, I don't know how much this company had in revenue, but let's say it had three or four. No, we, we know how much they had. They had one point. One point something. Un, under, one, under one something. So there were can't... a lot of one point something. So it's 50 million in cash. Guys, relax. So you're not going to, yeah, you're not going to clear the pref stack. Uh, you would take all equity at a company that like was in a really good financial position, but they're taking the cash and you're not going to clear the pref stack on that. So you're not, the common gets wiped out. So the yeah, incentives for the founder CEO to do anything but return capital at that point is like not very high unless they, that person uh, or any other person needs a job there. Um, you know, I, I think about this and we talked about this previously is like, there's definitely some pain parts of this coming, but at the end of the day, like, I think we're, we just got to stay grounded in what we're doing and uh, and stay pretty focused. I was going to make a quip here. Uh, we're talking about the, the the private companies and private markets. The breaking news today is that uh, a fund just marked down Twitter 47%. Did you guys see that? No. Ooh. Is it Fidelity? Yeah. Fidelity is always the one that's publishing no, it's, their uh, Kathy, arcs. Kathy Wood's ARC writes Ooh. down stakes by 47% Wall Street Journal. Yeah, breaking today. So there have it is. Been we, using, have you been using Twitter or threads? AJ? What a stylish segue. No. Look at these guys <laughs> becoming pros with podcasts and no, shit. Here's what, I, here's what I use. I use, Mind break. <laughs> I, use Reddit, I use Reddit, which is screenshots of Twitter, which is screenshots of Instagram. So that's my yeah. social media. I was like sharing this. I don't look, people talk about threads. I want to, Austin has talked about it. Like, let's, let, if you, either of you used it, yeah, I've used it. I mean, I um, I think it's really interesting. I just like, I don't know if apps, like m maybe apps can have like a tone. I mean, I wouldn't, Twitter is just my feed in Twitter. Oftentimes when people, when I complain about Twitter, people like you're following the wrong people, but my feed is just generally like assholes. Yelling like at just, each other, all caps. It's just, it's just this the t this tone of discourse yeah. is like sharp, very sharp. I don't know if I ever talked about how there was like the fake Sam Jackson guy whose name's Parker something. He's Parker Thompson, maybe. He's a VC. And I there was this one opportunity a couple of weeks ago where I was like trying to agree with him. And he he wouldn't let me agree with him. He kept <laughs> like mismatching me in this weird way. And I, I was just like, why do it's like they don't even want they don't even, yeah. they, they're just used to this discursive style of like dickish snarky comments because I guess maybe their point of view is like, that's how you interact with somebody. It's just sort of like about the idea. But anyway, the point is Threads is much more positive, which I think is cool. And Threads is a little bit more fun, a little bit less focused on politics, it seems like. And um, yeah, so, I mean, I've, I don't know. I don't have a strong, I think, I think what, a, what other people have said, which I completely agree with, is just, just it's, it's a testament to how much people wanted an alternative to Twitter and just didn't have a viable one. And when they made it so easy to port your social graph over from Instagram, then all of a sudden tweds, threads is populated. You don't have to rebuild it from scratch. And I think, um, I don't know if he's, I don't know if he gives a shit or not, but I think Elon's probably, I don't know. I just think it's, uh, they, it was very funny listening to them talk, listening to people talk about Elon because there's a whole group of VCs in in the Valley that, 
even despite Twitter's declining usage and the markdowns are like, he's pushing product, he's pushing new releases, he's absolutely amazing, everybody should follow what Twitter's doing. And uh, it was just very strange to hear that perspective when you see this other competitor pop up with 100 million users in a couple of days. So, um, Well, I, I, I'm interested in the next like month to see all the startups. Right, if they stick around, it, it, which so is exactly your point. usage is down. It's down 50%. Yeah. It's really interesting. Like if you dig into this, we all are excited for 2023 to be in the rear view mirror. But there have been two really interesting things that have happened this year that a record for 100 million users for consumer products been broken twice. Once by ChatGPT, which is the most innovative thing we've seen in many years, probably since the cloud and probably more bigger and more impactful than the cloud, one could argue. And so that was the first. And then came Threads, which is a scaled back clone of Twitter. And then they broke the right, they set the record in five days with, you know, I think Scott Galloway had predicted five weeks and Kara Swisher was like, ooh, that's been aggressive. And they did it in five days. And so I think that's super interesting. It's the power of timing and distribution because there've been a lot of clones of Twitter. Um, Jack Dorsey has Blue Sky um, and there've been a number of others. None of them have taken off and it just speaks to the power of distribution. We've seen this now a couple of times. We saw this Microsoft. with... Teams and Microsoft, Slack and Salesforce, and now this. Like, uh, distribution is really something. Well, uh, we'll we'll keep, uh, there's always a weekly update on that. You know, uh, one thing I think we should mention to our listeners. <laughs> Are we transitioning? This is a transition. <laughs> I love this. AJ, AJ doesn't want to talk about threads Listen, anymore. This is why, look, <laughs> even though Asa did the introduction. We all have our stories. This is just like a, whatever. I'm in, I'm in a mood. I have never. Let's Greg, do this. Can you hook me? <laughs> uh, I, I, I want to talk about the, uh, the moment at last week where we, I think the three of us were kind of texting and, and we took a, we took a pause and um, we, w I went out to dinner, you went out to dinner, Sam, we all went out and like kind of just journaled. And uh, I just want to, this isn't, this is my early shout outs and wows, because this is what I'm doing. <laughs> this is how the show's going right now. But I, I took those two hours, that was one of the best two hours that I've spent in a long time. And like, frankly, just took that and didn't. So for all the listeners out there, just like, what the hell is AJ talking about? He's going off. Um, <laughs> You know, last week I uh, took a, a night off uh, from from electronics. Not really, because I was texting with you guys, and <laughs> spent the spent the spent the night just kind of like uh, pause and just writing and going through. But the reason I'm bringing this up is because I have a journal that I keep with me and keep it with me, and it has like all of these speakers that I've seen. I, I started it when I went and saw. Uh, to <clears throat> Um, Tony Robbins and Unleash the Power Within. And I, I kept it as a 12 year thing. I kind of shared some of the, the screenshots with you, uh, with you guys there. But it was a really, really interesting view in the last 12 years, just to like go through. I read almost every single page through that. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you, because I think that that's something I'm going to keep doing. And if you guys, anyone that's out there that's listening is like, hey, I'm kind of trying to figure out what I'm going to what I'm doing in life. We hear these guys talk about tech here. The, the, these, there's so much out there. There's a whole world out there. And like, we have to allow time and space to just really think about like what those things, what we want to go do, but also just to, to like take a pause and review. And um, so that's my wild and shout outs 30 <laughs> minutes early right now. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, AJ, <laughs> I think one of the things that was interesting that night um, was you were sending pictures of your journal to me and I said, and you have this like spider web life oh, yeah. ranking system. Why don't you tell people how that works and what the benefit is? Yeah, um, it's it's like the wheel of life, you could, you could call it. And so you have seven different parts to it. And there's the, you know, the physical relationship, basically, you score everything one through 10. And there's celebration, financial, I'm not going to remember all of the seven different parts of them. <laughs> and once a quarter, I'll sit down and go through and score each one. I really, really think through that. And so I'll score it uh, one through 10, and then I'll, I'll count out the points. But the idea isn't necessarily about scoring the highest. It's actually thinking about a wheel of a car, right? If you have this like unbalanced wheel that like kind of like clunks around, that'd be problematic. And so it's really thinking about uh, areas in your life that you want to improve, sure. And then setting goals to like how to improve those. Uh, it's kind of funny you said this, Sam, because when I sat down, I actually did that. I hadn't done it 
for a year. That's the kind of year that we're having. And I was, I was like religious. You used about to do it every something. quarter. I used to do, I had it every quarter. But the, the categories, everybody, I'm looking at the picture that AJ texted. It's finance, celebration, physical, emotional, relationship, time, and career. career and yeah. on May 2nd, 2022, the lowest scoring <laughs> category for AJ was time. Time. Five it's out of 10. Nice. So what does time. that mean? That means like time management? Yeah, it's time management. I think like the um, you have your, uh, obviously with my spouse, with my wife, relationship with her, but also with my kids and then my career. And I, like you guys, have probably spent a bulk of my time, time management in my career and heads down in our work. Uh, so it's really tough to balance those and others. But also at the end of the day, I, I'm, I'm a people pleaser. I say yes to everyone about everything. I have. It's always been a challenge of mine. Um, I always want to make uh, people happy or excited. It's something I've learned. You all probably know lots of people like this. and. Um, it's it's really challenging in the sense that people don't have perspective of how many others situations or relationships or text threads that you have going on. So if I get a reach out from a you know a founder like, hey, wanted to work on this thing, I'm like, hey, well, how about let's talk next month? And I keep pushing it. It's like, okay, I guess I'll, I'll make time for this person. So that's a little bit of a challenge. It's really um, really hard to to say no yeah. in that way. And you yes. feel like such a jerk sometimes being like, can we talk in September? Because I also don't know, <clears throat> Fred Wilson has this great blog post where, and I, I would, I'll, I'll try and find it later, but um, basically like just not doing things that he doesn't want to do. It was from a couple of years ago. And he had, he has this example where his friend was like, do you want to go see this, uh, see this event, you know, next Tuesday? And he's like, no, I don't. He's like, what, you're busy? He's like, no, I just don't want to go. And uh, there's a group of like, sometimes you just have to practice. Well, it's all about like, not caring what people think about you, which is, yeah. which, you know, which Eckhart Tolle addresses in the power of now. But, um, but just like the ability to elegantly be like, yeah, because I, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to be like, someone's like, can I get some time on your calendar in September? And I don't know how to be like, is it okay if we never talk? <laughs> 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 I don't know how to do that. So I'm always like, ah, it's September. And then I'm like, and then what happens is you reschedule like four times. Yep. And then you feel like, and then you're like, I just don't want to be the person like then you really get a negative reputation as like and I'm a constant rescheduler. So then it's yeah. like, okay, you can reschedule it twice, but on the third time you have to keep the appointment. Yeah. I um and then you keep that email on red in your inbox and you're like, ooh, this email is just gonna sit there, <laughs> simmer in my brain. Um five emails. Speaking of that that journal, I want to tell the the best story from that journal because I think it's really relevant now and it, it makes me giggle. And I told you guys that I would tell this story, but I just showed the yes. title. Yes, yeah, it's a great story. Uh, it's it's a business parable, and it was told to me by Josh Koppelman, who is the partner of First Round Capital. Um, but Josh was quick to say that this was something that he had heard, uh, but it was it was pretty funny at the time, and I still tell it, and I think it's more relevant today than ever. So. A CEO, a new incoming CEO walks into a company and uh, the outgoing CEO is there. And then the new CEO, she's like, hey, I've heard so much about you. I cannot wait to learn everything I possibly can uh, about the organization and the strategy and the ops and the plan and what's just going on. And he's like, whoa, 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 hold on. No, 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 no. I'm out the door. This is my last day. But, <laughs> but I'm going to give you three envelopes. And anytime you run into trouble, open the envelopes. They're labeled one, two, and three. Use them sparingly. You have to be in trouble. And she's like, what? What? And he just leaves. That's it. He's gone. So she's like, that was weird, but I guess I got a business to run. So here we go. So she's uh, going along and things are going pretty well. Her, uh, her first quarter feels like there's a new energy. Everyone's refreshed. Goes into the, the first board meeting, things go well. The second second uh, board meeting, as she's coming into it, they had an off quarter. They missed their financial plan and target. And she's trying to think through, like, how is she going to come up with the story and the narrative for what happened? And then she remembers the envelopes. She goes and grabs, uh, looks for it. Oh, it's underneath the in her desk and buried. So she pulls out, sees it, one. She rips it open and it says, she looks at it, it says, blame your predecessor. Like, oh, brilliant. <laughs> 
He goes, yeah, that, so she walks into the board meeting. She's like, the C, that CEO is total asshole. Like S Sam didn't know what he was doing. He was totally off by <laughs> everything. And he was just, a, he just didn't understand it at all. And the, the board's like, yeah, that's why, yeah, that's right. That's why we, we, we got rid of him. And they're like, okay, great. So she's like, oh, that was pretty easy. So uh, another quarter goes by and things are still really tough. This time she doesn't hesitate. She opens up the second envelope and it says reorg. She's like, oh, great. So she restructures the business. She cha makes his changes. She goes in, you know, the CS team is now reporting to marketing and sales and uh, is now reporting to engineering and whatever. <laughs> She's like, this is going to, this is great. And then the board's like, yeah, that's actually, that makes a lot of sense. Go do that. So she does it and um, it does it goes really poorly. And like, now she's like hesitating to open that third envelope. She's like, I can't just do it. But finally she gives in, opens it. Do you know what it says? I do know what it says. It says prepare three envelopes. <laughs> <laughs> was that what you thought? Is that what you yeah, said? Yeah, of course. Yes. How'd you connect those dots? I was I've heard the story before. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Look at you guys. I like that story. Um, there's, there's something about the, the thing as you were talking that stood out was there are a lot of bad decisions that get uh, approved by boards. And then in hindsight, you're like, how did this get approved? And like, that seems to be happening lots and lots right now. Like that reorg where you like sales reports into engineering. It's not like, it's not shocking. Like you can even see that happen somewhere. Yeah. Well, yeah. I didn't, I mean, I kind of laughed at it at the time because I, you know, we started our careers or I started my founding career in 2012 and like everything's up and to the right and things I've been through. And then and like you hit the real, real and you're like, oh, this three envelope story is way more real than, than <laughs> I ever thought. It was like, there's a lot of truth to this. Um, so it's just kind of interesting to, to, to see that, but yeah, my journal, something I look back at, there's a couple pages in there, the, the wheel. Thanks Sam for, for bringing that up. Um, so I have to tell the audience, your writing got really a lot better as we got closer to 2023. Like you have lost the past ones. It was wild. Like you were just scribbling shit. Scribbling right <laughs> then now. now there's like finesse and shit. Yeah. Well now 2023, that's all out the window. It's total. It's like, it's <laughs> back to yeah, back to our uh, our docket and regular scheduled programming. <laughs> Austin, Austin, so uh, talking about interest rates, talked about the Twitter thread. Um, what else? What do you else? You there got? was something that Sam shared yesterday that connects to this uh, Twitter thing that's been bothering me, which is like people are trying to uh, intellectualize. I know that this fight between Zuckerberg and Musk and trying to like create a logical reason for it. Like it's a good for society. It's good for the kids. It's good for humanity. And like, I like the spectacle. I find it fascinating. I would watch the fight, but there's no part of me that's like, Ooh, this is a net positive for society that two of our smartest technologists are going to go and bash each other's faces. in. like, it's, it's very annoying that sometimes investors like in this case, Mark Andreessen will try and Peter Thiel is taking the same stance. Like they're trying to make this sound like we should be doing more of this. And that just is really annoying to see in society. So I, I don't know. Completely agree with you. I, I find, I don't know, there was a period of time when I think... Do you think both of them have ever had a fight in their lives? No, no way. Well, maybe Peter Thiel. I don't know. But... <laughs> I, uh, and I guess, and then Mark Andreessen, he'd be like, I'm a, I was a corn husker, you know, like I would grow up on a farm or whatever. I find that he, I used to think his words were much more, you know, oracular. They're much more, I don't even know if that's a word, but like much, much more insightful and interesting. And I found his commentary of late to be really uninspired and kind of, he thinks that when he like says something, it's, there's, 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 there's a, there was a period on Twitter when he was like, when he was saying really controversial, interesting things. And then I think he got, he felt like he was being, you know, condemned or uh, the, you know, the popular culture was revolting against him and he was being canceled. So then he went dark. And then since he's come, I don't know, he, so he wrote this long thing defending how, you know, mixed martial arts is the oldest sport in human history. And Elon and Zuck are demonstrating to everybody why they need to protect themselves. And it's all because the streets are violent on inner cities and you really need to, and this is, it's like, what do you, and, what and are you I, on? I don't know, it's just so weird. And I just, I don't know. I don't, 
His follow-up post is going to be trying to bring back. You know how they used to duel in uh, France back in the day, like yeah, for any exactly. The dueling just went out of fit, you know. So anyway, it was just sometimes she, I don't know. I don't have. A, I don't know what my point I is. I feel like people are. You know, we admire these technologists from afar. Like Mark Andreessen was the reason we have web browsers, right? Like when you read his story as a technologist and even as an investor, like, wow. And then they get this admiration from society and it feels great to be admired. And then they go and they start sharing their point of view about everything. And then society is like, okay, you're really good at a bunch of shit, but you're a fucking idiot when it comes to this. Like, uh, I think Musk is having, if you took Twitter, like there was no Musk on Twitter, he'd be the most admired person in the world, right? Like uh, I think Strat Galloway said this in his podcast recently, he'd be, literally be the most admired person in the world. But because of how he shares his opinion on everything in a certain way on Twitter, it changes the perception. It's all like uh, juvenile dick jokes. You know, that's most of us like Twitter commentary. It is really interesting because what happens is you get really popular and then there's a group of people that are sycophantic and and they tell you how amazing you are. And then what happens is you train yourself and you have a lot of self-talk about how the people that don't like you need to be ignored. And, you know, what they call them on all in, they call them the mids. You know, like there's a group of average people. We don't really care what they what they think. I know that I'm right because I'm going to the right parties and people are telling me how genius I am. I mean, I don't, it's just, I, I don't even know if uh, I disagree that I'm happy to have people have opinions on anything they want, but I just find it so, the stridency is the thing I have a problem with, like the lack of nuance. That's what ultimately annoys me the most is that these issues can tend to be so complicated and people present these views. And everybody that says that you need to talk to different perspectives and you need to really have like a clear, nuanced, complicated view on life still resorts to tribalism, especially in mediums like Twitter, where the other, you know, for David Sachs, it's like, you know, the liberals and the woke, Mm. the woke madrasas of the higher education institutions and, you know, the liberal media elite and all of those things to him are one two dimensional being. And he is three dimensional and nuanced and sophisticated, but everything other than him is completely understandable and simplistic. And he understands their motivations and it's all distilled down to like a very easy essence. And that's the problem with, you know, humankind. Why can't we all be like, MySpace Tom. That guy <laughs> that was just so friendly. He was so nice. And then his company Who's got MySpace he, Tom? He oh, was the original the, the original founder friend. of MySpace. Like everybody founder, was a friend with him. That you said yeah, MySpace. Younger, you, you have he was to like tell a really nice guy. Things. He was a good guy. He and then he just fucked off after he like made <laughs> really? after I think Fox bought him for five hundred million eggs. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And then he like made a shit ton of money and and like we never heard from him again. So like what is what's <laughs> I think it's just, it's comical to, to like try. It's frustrating to, to watch this happen and to see like these egos manifest in just these really weird ways. And um, I don't, I don't know. I don't think Zuckerberg's like one to feed into it, but they're, they're doing whatever. We'll see how, like, how does this end? Like, there's, are they actually, I think they're going to get the Coliseum. That's what they, that's, this is that's actually going to happen. This is where Italy's economy is at. They like call, they're like, we'll offer you the Coliseum. We need some eyeballs here. Please. <laughs> this like, is, the these are, te- is this, is, this is generative. This is real generative AI. This is, like, <laughs> this is actually just, <laughs> they both Did announce you? a merger or something at that point. I, uh, the, I think this is why I don't like short form social media. I think it creates this dynamic where, like yes. you don't when i read jamat's uh annual letters they're so well reasoned they're so articulate like he's so smart over there and then i think when you force yourself into 120 or 250 characters and linkedin's doing the same shit right like only one line shows now and it just i i think it brings the worst out of society when that's how that's the medium in which we're communicating with each other and now you've got people with track records that have been like this peter thiel and mark andreessen but they're now setting the example for the non-track record VCs who are assholes without the track record to back it up. And you don't yeah. see these people out in the market. You see them already and it's very annoying. What do you know about the returns of Andreessen Horowitz? Asa? I don't know much uh, like the actual numbers. All I've heard is that like everything I've read or heard about them is that that shine that they had when they first came into the market is gone. 
Um, you know, you talked about Union Square Ventures. People don't realize how special that firm is. Their returns are way better in the last couple of years than Sequoia's returns and hmm. uh, than Founders uh, Founders the Speed Founders Deal Fund one. Uh, Founders oh, Fund. Right. Yeah. And yeah, then I Union guess Square is like amazing. Whereas uh, I think A16Z has had to amalgamate certain funds, which is never a good sign. Their crypto practice was a disaster. Um, yeah. And they've just lost that shine. Well, does that, is that really, I mean, I think from the LP side that that means something from the founder side, do like the founders are paying attention to that? No, no. they're still like A16Z. Well, it's because they deploy a bunch of resources, but I think, yeah. I think that I was asking that question also, because I think I heard something to the same effect that they, their most recent vintages are terrible because they, they're such a, they manage so much capital at this point that they have to write really large checks and they've written, I mean, they wrote, what is it? A $300 million check into Adam Newman's new real yeah. estate thing. I mean, maybe that's going that, well. Did that get written off already? We just, we just got that <laughs> I, check. I don't know. I don't know. I when know you that. want, when you see Adam Newman on stage, though, you can see why, like, he's able to raise that money, like, from all of these investors. Like, I can see, like, I saw him on stage with Mark Andreessen in Saudi Arabia. Like, I saw the video of it. I wasn't there. And like, even though you know he destroyed WeWork, when you hear him talk, you're like, I, I can see it. This guy in a pitch meeting is just gonna fucking kill it. I don't. Yeah, know. I mean, and did he? He didn't destroy. You know, I still, he's, he's a, he is not the worst entrepreneur that I've, that, uh, you know, that I've come across. Like we work is still a good product. You know, I still, yeah. I, I like going to we work. You said it, something a while ago, which I love vibes adjusted EBITDA. <laughs> <laughs> no. What were you going to say, AJ? I just, I mean, he evangelized the category. Like anyone, any founder that's able to take something and really create a revolution and create following i mean whether you think it's a cult following or not with his school and his him and his wife's like whole world view uh, yeah i think he did some absolute shady things and got away with it and walked away with it they were pretty public like he leased his own apartments that he bought with we work money back to we work and like that shit is like what i guess that's okay and where you have that and then you like you look you look you turn the page and you're like Fire Festival <laughs> founder <laughs> is in jail. I'm like, well, that's okay. That's interesting. There um, was this uh, period in which there was a show on WeWork and there was a show on Uber at the same time uh, in the world. And they were both really good shows. People should go watch it. The WeWork one was Jared Leto and it was just amazing. Yeah. He did such a fantastic job of being Andrew, uh, uh, this guy. But Benchmark was the commonality in those two uh, shows. They were the firm that had backed uh, WeWork properly and Uber properly. That <laughs> that period wasn't good for Benchmark's brand. Like it really, they took a hit over there because of the way that they were portrayed. But those are great shows if people haven't seen. How are we feeling about uh, the uh, the rest of the summer, guys? You guys are. <laughs> I'm just on my own. Listen, my vibes of adjusted EBITDA is off we, the charts We should right shut now. down the show if we can't think of what to say. No, I'm just. Um... <laughs> I'm. Uh, well, I'm going to. Uh, I'm going to the Insight Conference mindset yeah, mindset uh, tomorrow morning, and uh, Wednesday's my birthday, and Ooh. I'm doing a talk with Pablo on stage at that conference, and then I am flying to Norfolk. And the big news for me is that I got my name lifted from the do not rent list that I was on because I didn't pay like running a red light back in 2019 or 2020 when I was renting a car from Hertz. And I like two times since then, both times when I'm trying to go to the beach to visit my family and the Outer Banks, I go to the rental desk having forgotten that my name's on the do not rent list and then I have to scramble at last minute. So I finally took the steps to get my name removed. So I'm going to drive to the Outer Banks on Wednesday night and I'll be with my family through next week. And then, uh, and then I'm going to uh, men's sleepaway camp, which is what uh, me and a bunch of friends, uh, we get a, the same house every summer and we've been doing it. We've been doing it in some form or the other for probably 20 years. And it's really funny because now when we do it, um, it's like when we used to do it, it was just an excuse to go absolutely mindless with partying and, you know, do a bunch of drugs and alcohol. And like, you know, you end, you end the weekend on Sunday and you feel like on a death. stretcher. 
<laughs> and now, you know, now most people don't even drink. <laughs> so <laughs> now it's like we're planning out our hikes and we're planning out tubing and, uh, you know, we're planning. How long like have you done this, Sam? This sounds really like a nice way to maintain friendship. Like how long does this? Uh, we've been doing this particular version. We've been going to the same house for five years, but we've been doing some kind of summer weekend since I was 29. So 17 years. Holy shit. And these are people I've known since 1995. So I've known them 28 years. And That's Sam, awesome. do you have siblings? Yeah, I have an older brother and older sister. But but to your point, Asad, it's really, it's become, it's cool when you get the same house every year because it feels like you're stepping out of time because the house doesn't yeah. change and you're just there and it's this peaceful moment and you can catch up with everybody. How's your life? You have real conversations. You know, we, we make a fire every night. We sit around the fire and talk and um, yeah, it's really, it's really, and of course everybody's become like a great cook. So like we plan out the meals. It's really, uh, it's special. Adult. It's really yeah. adults. Yeah. Uh, it's are, they, are, are any of them in tech? One of them, you know, uh, I gave free pavilion memberships to a few of them. And so my friend Aaron, uh, he started a company. He's starting a company that's like a, a CRM system slash booking management system for uh, coaches, for like personal trainers and people that do individual one-on-one -on -one coaching. So he's now in tech. And uh, my friend Matt uh, runs a business that he sold and he's now in tech for uh, climate. So, uh, and then my friend Derek is a member of the DC chapter and he works for Acum. Well, he works for Salesforce now selling consulting services. So yeah, they are in touch. Almost all of them. Are. Yeah. <laughs> Increasingly. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I have a, a similar group of friends that I have from college, a little different, but I asked that because none of them are in tech. So when I get together with them, they're like three are doctors, uh, two others work in healthcare. It's always just like, not, it's me explaining what I've been up to. Like I had um, uh, a trip to Park City uh, at the beginning of the year. And oh, I remember that. that. When yeah, it's when yeah. SVB. So they were all like skiing in Deer Valley and like, AJ, come. Like, well, my bank's crashing. They're like, what? <laughs> well, that sucks. See you later. Because <laughs> 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 they hit the slope. So they, since that, uh, that trip, but they've also kind of followed, like they, they we always go visit someone uh, every year differently. And so when I was in Austin, they would come down and hang out and, uh, that was something similar as well. It's a really big deal. Like having that group of friends that are just like stability. I don't know. Sam text yeah. with yours all the time, but like, Oh yeah. And, and you know, the funny thing about it, it was that a couple, it was like, we started doing it when they had, when people, I don't have kids, but they had smaller children. And so, and I would, and I was like, Hey guys, like, let's get a house. Let's go upstate for the weekend. And it was such a fucking pain in the ass to get them to agree because maybe they were in a different financial position and they're like, I, you know, like I got to figure, talk to them. And so I, so the, the thing that happened is that I said, I'm going to get the house. I'm just going to get the house. I'll pay for it. You just have to fucking come and you can like cook mm. and do the food. And that was the catalyst that eventually got people coming. And then the house only rents like for a full week or whatever, but we go on a Wednesday. But it used to be that everybody showed up like late Thursday night. And this is when I can get off. This is when I can get off. And now everybody plans it out like nine months in advance, clears it with their wives and arrives Wednesday morning because everybody's like makes this. And so it's cool. It's like it's got a life of its own. It's neat. You need things like this with friends. Like I think those close friends are so important in these type of journeys and you need to have rituals like this because it's very hard to like spend time. Or at least I really struggle to spend time with my friends on a regular basis. And so I need to be better about at least having a yearly thing of this sort. Otherwise, the friendships disintegrate. Like a lot of the people that I uh, grew up or uh, are my closest friends are now in different parts of the world. Some are in Dubai, some are in London, some are in other spots. And I, that's a good idea. I'm going to steal this. Well, I think it. the other thing is, you know, um, you know, men, I mean, uh, it's harder for men sometimes. It's harder for men to open up and um, be emotional and say things like, I love you. Uh, and it's harder to let your guard down and have a moment where you can be transparent, where you're not positioning. You know, we, so one of the rituals is like we read a book every year, like a book club heading into the weekend. And so we're reading this book called The Status Game uh, by this guy, Will Store, which is a great book. Well, I've heard of this, yeah. And it's all about how all of our interactions as humans are positioning and about seeking and, and pursuing status. And it's one place uh, every year where you can, you can be like, yeah, I'm not doing that well. 
You know, like this is what's yeah. going on and this is what I'm struggling with. And yeah, I could use a hug. So it's cool. Have you guys ever heard of this thing where it's in the Hindu culture? It's like this, um, it, it, it's part of the Hindu, uh, Buddhist culture where you go into this monastery for 10 days and no one talks for those 10 days. It's called Vipassana. It's a big thing in tech in the Valley right now. A bunch of entrepreneurs go into it. So it's like this way of like, you go in there, you quiet for 10 days, you eat very simple food. And if you're in your head for 10 days, you can't say a word, you don't want to have some realizations. And it's a really tough thing. Like most people will have, will cry hysterically on day three or four. It's really trying, right? Like imagine the three of us shutting up completely for 10 days. So my best friend went for it. Uh, he's right now a partner at Accenture. And when he came back, most people come back humbled. When he came back, we're like, yo, so what'd you learn? He's like, honestly, day five, I was like, I'm the best person in the world. What the <laughs> fuck? Fuck everyone. I got this. Everyone at work's an idiot. Everyone here is an idiot. I'm the smartest guy on earth. And he believed it. It was amazing. It was amazing to see that. I don't like this person very much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hopefully none of his partners at Accenture listen to this show. <laughs> Just what an asshole. Yeah, an asshole. Um, should yeah. we do shout outs and wins of the week? You already sort of did one, AJ. Yeah, I was a, that was just an impromptu one. I was improvising halfway through the show. I I will just I'm gonna apologize ahead to any of our listeners. Like, what is what's going on with AJ today? <laughs> what do you mean? Um, I don't know. I feel like I'm a, I'm a little bit more jumpy than I I typically am. I mean, I'm typically a jumpy person. I'm just are you okay? It's, yeah, I mean, I have, uh, I alluded to some of the health stuff that I am, I'm uh, going through. And I've had some, I had a test today that I haven't got the results and um, I'll find out tomorrow. So I think I'm just a little bit more, you know, anxious. Than, All right. I'm doing Sorry okay. to hear that. Okay. No, 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 I'm good. Listen, I am healthy. I have a wonderful, fa- this is not my shout out. This is just me. I have a wonderful, <laughs> I have wonderful co-hosts. I have a wonderful group of friends. I have a wonderful family. Wonderful company I, that you started. Wonderful company. But like, it's, it's all like, and life is good. My shout out goes to uh, my customer Drada. Um, we had a fantastic uh, one hour call with, um, with Ashley who runs uh, compensation commissions there. And she just gave, she gave so much great feedback and very validating. Uh, and and some things that I'm going to use for the board meeting, frankly, on on Wednesday, um, as I think about our like design partners and and uh, so just a huge shout out Drada. They've they've grown uh, tremendously. I don't know if you guys know who they are, um, but they're in more of the security SOC two uh, type two compliance world, and um, they're they're killing it. So shout out to uh, to Ashley and Drada. Yeah, good job, back. Ashley. Awesome. Nicely done, Ashley. Um, okay, so I shall, I don't know what this is a shout out of. It's a shout out of a ritual. So when I became CEO, I looked into working with an exec coach and then I just never did it. And then I knew that Sam had had quite a transformative experience working with his. And then when we started this podcast, AJ, both of you actually mentioned a couple of times uh, were things that you had interacted with uh, your coaches on um state changes and all these things and i was like i want a state change like on a bad week i can just connect with somebody and do something to like feel better like i want that so i started working with an exec coach um recently um sam and i sam's i stole sam's exec coach we get the same homework now we're a little bit <laughs> confused about that's, that. re- that's why you guys have a secret texting group. he's there reusing his lesson plans there it is so we're a little bit confused we're like i hope this is a unique thing but all of that to say the coach uh identified very quickly that i don't sit with wins or uh spend a lot of time being grateful and so he gave me this exercise of every morning i have to start the day by writing something i'm grateful for and a win from the previous day and then some action item for the next week and the type of person i am when he said it, i was like Ugh, this sounds useless and then i started doing it and a week and a half later i genuinely was a happier person and so it was like a little change it takes me four minutes five minutes a day but i'm genuinely happier uh, more bearable probably at home now because of that so i shout out that ritual probably the coach probably you guys along the way all of that i love that Love well, it. to the point, um, Austin and I were talking over the weekend and we realized we're both listening to the power of now. So my shout outs to, uh, I always, so this it's this Eckhart Tolle, I guess it's Tolle is how you pronounce it, uh, book. Maybe I'm sure a million people that are listening. Well, there's a couple hundred people that are listening. Not really, but <laughs> a portion of them are, have, have, have read it or heard it. I hadn't. And I always, 
you know, it's like, it's an Oprah book. You feel like maybe it's a bunch of bullshit. Maybe it's a bunch of new age, you know, hoo but it's brilliant. It's freaking brilliant. And, uh, that plus, uh, coach, I, you know, I still talk, the guy's name is John Mark Shaw for those out there. He's, he's great. And he's really helped me a lot. And, uh, and now he's helping Asad. And then I started working with uh, a personal trainer, uh, named Richard Decker. And we, uh, he's got this truck that he has all these bands on and he drives up to your driveway and you work out in the driveway for 40 minutes and then he drives off. But those things in combination have really, um, I feel like much, much, much more centered uh, than I have over a long time. And I feel like no matter what happens, I'm going to be okay, which is technically true, but sometimes not always something that you believe. So the the book, The Power Now is really, really quite brilliant. And uh, I really encourage people to to absorb it and to really think about it. And I'm using it pretty much every day. I'm just like taking a few moments here and there where I can just let my mind stop thinking so that I can just be present um, in the eternal now, which is the only moment that we ever have. So if you haven't read it, give it a shot. I'm going to get it now just so I can join the... It's really... Next, I would listen to it on Audible. Listen to it on Audible because it's just like it, it's even more powerful. And yeah. it's this Q&A thing of like they ask him questions. How How can you ever let go of fear? And then he answers. And the answer is always, now you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Um, I'm gonna send another us one home? for the books. Uh, yeah. Asad, go for it. Holy shit. Okay. Well, I hope everyone enjoyed this episode. Take care. Signing off from Asad Zaman, CEO of Sales Sound Agency, AJ Bruno, the third CEO and co-founder of Crotopod, and Sam Jacobs, the first, the only CEO and co-founder of Pavilion. See you next week, guys. Thanks, everybody. Next week. This episode of Top Line was brought to you by ContractBook. ContractBook's holistic contract management platform allows businesses to scale with accessible, actionable, future-proof contracts. Step into the new era at contractbook.com and take control of your contracts for good. Thank you for listening to this episode of Top Line. To learn more about the trends, news, and developments impacting the world of B2B SaaS, head to joinpavilion.com, where more than 10,000 of the world's top go-to market leaders go to achieve and unlock their full professional potential.